not for the squeamish. Before we get into the description of the crimes, are you guys okay to tell me your background in writing true crime? Right. Go ahead. Uh, well, it started out with Phil wrote a couple of memoirs about his childhood. You want to tell a little about well, that? Well, Sean, I grew up in a federal housing area, a lot of violence, a lot of crime. I got involved with some wrong, the wrong people from the neighborhood. And uh, between three, me and three of my friends, we accumulated 52 arrests, multiple felonies, two shot, two stabbed, one paralyzed. I sidestepped my felony charges, changed my life, which, Sean, you know as well as anybody can be done. Uh, went on the road to college, and I've been working as a high school teacher for the last 35 years, especially working with uh, a lot of real severe problem children in the school. Wow, fantastic. What, what, what made you um, collaborate then on this book? Uh, well, uh, one of the stories that Phil wrote about, about his childhood involved uh, four of his friends being murdered out at a, a state park in northwest Iowa. And we also wrote a book about that. But their one girl survived. And she, after 40, over 40 years, she wanted someone to finally write her story. And she asked us to do it. So that was our first dipping uh, our toes into true crime. And this is the book right here. And it went to a national number one bestseller. And that profiles my childhood best friend and those kids from my neighborhood that were killed in a mass murder and the life of Sandra Chesky, who survived that mass murder. Extremely interesting story. So then when we would go out and talk about that book, we had a lot of people ask us, would you write about Robert Lee Roy Anderson? That's the duct tape killer, because this happened in the early 90s when there wasn't the Internet. People had just gotten snippets of things from the newspaper and wondered about it. So. And Sean, uh, this serial killer is from our hometown. Sioux Falls, South Dakota. South Dakota is right in the middle of the country. And he actually, the serial killer, Robert Lee Anderson, went to the same high school that I went to, but he's younger than me. Before we get to him then, you've got me, my curiosity peaked about this mass murder. What happened there? Oh, that was like a... a Something out yeah, of a horror that's movie. That's uh, I was looking for. A, a, group, a group of my friends had got together. It was a very mild November evening, and Gitche Manitou State Park is located about 14 miles east of our hometown. And they went out there to build a campfire to bring a, a guitar along and just talk and hang out. And three devious killers came out of the dark and ended up executing all of the boys and taking Sandra Chesky away for a violent rape. And one of the killers was supposed to finish her off and not leave a living witness. But through st some strange twists, he allowed her to live. And she became known as the Gitchy Girl because this murder took place at Gitchy Manitou State Park. And uh, she lost her identity. Uh, she was only 13 years old at the time, a very young girl. And uh, actually lost her virginity through a violent rape that night. And she didn't talk about it for over 40 years. She kept it all away from everybody. Mm -hmm. She turned down, on the anniversary of that mass murder, she turned down interviews by the newspapers, media. She had turned down book offers. And I've actually known Sandra Chesky since we've been teenagers. And I had a personal connection to this mass murder. How did three killers come to be together on that night? Well. Sean, they were three they're... brothers. Uh, three brothers, three sociopaths. And actually, this book actually just caught the attention of Hollywood. Uh, we can't go into any more detail until uh, things come out on it. Uh, but they were three brothers. They had actually gone to the park to poach a deer that night. They were going to shoot a deer illegally. And they heard the teenagers talking and singing. And, of course, then it turned violent. Are they a history of violence? Not much. They primarily had a history of poaching animals, uh, theft, theft, stealing farm animals, that kind of thing. That we know of. They, they hadn't been caught doing anything extremely violent. Well, that's a big leap. What factors made them tip over to killing humans? Well, we, I believe, you know, first, uh, when, if you dig into that story, Gitchy Girl, that we wrote, there was never any solid motive. I believe it was, it was about the sexual assault. Of course, you got three sociopaths wielding shotguns. Uh, they were loaded with double-odd buckshot, if anybody knows anything about ballistics. So they were loaded to be able to take down deer. So you can imagine what those teenagers went through that night. Uh, they did not, when the shooting started, they did not aim at Sandra Chesky, who they could tell was a female. And they did not aim at a young 14-year-old. He had shoulder-length hair. He had a light jacket on. 
in the campfire, they thought he was a female as well. When they found out he was a male, he was kept at the park to be executed with the wounded boys. So I believe it was also about sexual assault. And did the kids die instantly then from the shotgun? No. 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 One did. The others were severely wounded. A night of terror. A lot of people that uh, from the local area thought it was a pretty quick kill. They came in and killed the teenage boys, took her for the rape, but it didn't. It went on and on and on. It's a very compelling story. And how long did it take for them to get apprehended? Uh, it was about 12 days. Almost two weeks. Mm -hmm. How did they get right. caught? And, well, this is, this is the thing. We ended up writing a second book about it based on stories from law enforcement officers. And the stories were so unreal. If you wrote it as a fiction book, no one be would believe it. And the 13-year-old girl, Sandra Chesky, basically ended up apprehending one of the killers. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a very compelling story. Uh, after, when they killed the boys at the park, uh, Sean, they took her away to an abandoned farm for the rape. So for two weeks, they were searching for this abandoned farm. They had drawn sketches of it. They made multiple photocopies. They were handing it out to farmers and rural, rural delivery drivers in the area. Be on the lookout for this abandoned farm. And if they got a favorable hit, they would take the lone survivor, that young girl, out to look at it. No, that's not the place. No, that's not the place. And one day when they were going out there to look, she happened to spot one of the killers. Wow. It's just, uh, just coming down the road. Yeah. Good she grief. recognized the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And what kind of sentences did they get? They, they all got life in prison. Life without and parole. Life without parole in prison. They are all still in prison. Wow. So this is uh, really close to home for you guys then, all this, this crime stuff. Right. Yeah. You went to school with Robert Leroy Anderson. We actually went to the same high school, but I'm older than he is, Sean. A, a very big high school. Actually, the biggest high school in the state of South Dakota. But he did go to the same high school. Did you know him then, or was it a different... No. Yeah. No, did not. Yeah. What was his background then? What led to him committing the crimes? Well, he came from a very he, a dysfunctional family. There was a time when he... His two brothers and his dad were all in prison at the same time. Um, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't. Uh... Well, a lot of violence in the home. Uh, one of the family members who wished to remain anonymous told us that the females in the family were degraded. The boys were raised that uh, females were only as sex objects. There was a lot of, a lot of violence. And again, when you have the father and all of the sons incarcerated in maximum security prison at the same time, you get a family of dysfunction. Now, one thing about Robert Lee Ray Anderson, I'll add before uh, I forget about this is, Sandy and I kind of thought he was maybe operating at maybe a lower intellectual level, wasn't a very smart guy, but he was very intelligent. In fact, the high school that he went to, he was placed in accelerated classes for gifted and talented students. And he went on to take engineering classes after high school graduation. And his professor said he, he did very well academically. And I'll add that he had a complicated relationship with his dad. They sometimes didn't talk for months on end, but then they would become somewhat close. And there was a time when Robert Anderson was in high school and he had a very close friend, Glenn Walker. Glenn's family moved several hours away, hundreds of miles away. And Robert Leroy Anderson moved with them and lived with them for quite some and, time. And I'm a high school teacher, not very many parents or guardians are gonna let a teenager pack up and move hundreds of miles away to live. So it's it gives you this sense, Sean, of dysfunction within this family. So in your book, you've got a chapter that says early 1990s Ukraine. What's the Ukrainian connection? Okay, um, Larissa and um, her yeah. husband, Bill Demansky, came from the Ukraine in the 1990s. They were Pentecostal Christians. They were persecuted. So they qualified for religious asylum. And they got a job at the John Morrell Meatpacking Plant. It's a huge industry in Sioux Falls. They have thousands of employees. And it's something that somebody could do if they didn't speak English. Larissa, however, spoke several languages. She was intelligent. Everyone loved her. She was just so outgoing. And one day in 1994, she doesn't come back home. She just disappears. Mm -hmm. Okay, she's a missing person. They find her car keys in the door lock of her van in the parking lot of the Morell's meatpacking plant where she got off work at one o'clock in the morning. She was very responsible. She was six weeks pregnant at the time. There was a flat tire on her van. And so there's this huge search for Larissa Demansky. 
flyers are put up. Armies of volunteers are looking anywhere where a body could be found. And the case just goes cold. Yes, they brought in dogs. They even investigated a circus that had been in town. This is not a very populated state. Murders are rare. So they investigated this to every end. So obviously, as we move through this crime, Larissa Demansky is going to be intertwined with this Robert Leroy Anderson. Why did he target her? Oh, he liked good-looking women. She was very good-looking. She was built very well, very pretty. And he, he had, after he was finally apprehended, he had all kinds of other women staked out. He knew their habits, when, when they came, came and went, where they lived. And they were all very good-looking women. They kind of all, if you met all the women that he killed or tried to abduct and kill, they all kind of looked the same. Dark-haired, good-looking. And what happened then on the night that she disappeared? What did he do to her? Well, uh, eventually, you know, we tell that story down the line. We open up the story with Piper Striley and her family, okay. a young couple, a young couple in their 20s. We open up the book with the phone call. Something was wrong. You had a young couple, Piper and Vance Striley. They were in their 20s. They were raising two children. Their daughter, Shana, was almost four years old, and their son, Nathan, had just turned two years old. On Monday morning, I believe it was July 29th, 1996, that, Piper doesn't show up for work. Right, and that's about two years after Larissa disappeared. Okay, she doesn't show up for work, which is not like Piper Striley. A good person, her and her husband, very religious, very, very reliable. They even had a Bible camp on their rural property. They had Bible campers that would come out there, do shoot archery. They would have uh, Bible lessons. They would do all kinds of stuff. And so when she doesn't show up for work, a co-worker calls her home. The phone rings and rings and rings. And little Shana, who's almost four, finally answers. And the co-worker said, honey, is your mommy home? No. Is your daddy home? No. Is there a babysitter? No, they are killed. And then Shana hangs up the phone. Well, now the co-worker is on red alert. She gets a hold of another co-worker sitting next to her. They get 911 on the phone, and the 911 operator says, call the little girl back and see if we can get more information. So the co-worker calls back to Piper Striley's home. Little Shana answers again. Honey, when did mommy leave? Now Shana's crying. She left a while ago. There was a mean man in a black car that carried mommy away. Mommy's going to die. I don't want mommy to die. I don't want daddy to die. And then Shana hangs up the phone again. And from there, of course, authorities are dispatched to the Striley residence. So this young mother is abducted in broad daylight in front of her children. Good grief. And what is he doing to these women? Well, pretty uh, heinous stuff. Right. He was a sexual sadist. And they determined what he did to these women based on a conversation that Leroy Anderson has much later on once he's convicted of kidnapping Piper Striley. So to back up just a little bit, do you want to tell about the well the kidnapping charge? Okay, well here now there's this huge investigation. They know the dad comes home, the little girl cries, said there was a loud noise, a mean man in a black car took mommy away. So they set up a roadblock out in front of the Stryley residence, and they're stopping anybody that goes by. It's a rural home. And a road grader driver comes by. A road grader is uh, the machine that you know smooths out the gravel roads or the dirt roads in rural areas. So they stop him, and he says that I did see something unusual this morning. Right. He says... I'm grading the road, and this black Bronco, all black, even the tire rims are black, the hubcaps are black, the fenders are black. It's coming toward me, and about 100 yards away, it does a U-turn, goes down in the ditch, and speeds off the other way. Then I see it again, a little later, coming from a different direction. And so they've got this strange black vehicle. They've got little Shana saying, a mean man in a black vehicle. Now, later on, Vance Striley, Piper's husband, remembers, mm -hmm. hmm, Piper has just gone missing on Monday. The Friday before, a strange man knocks on their door. Vance answered. This man looks flustered. He's surprised to see Vance answer the door. The man stammers around and said, uh, uh, do you guys have a Bible camp or something here? And he tells Vance Striley 
I'm interested in your Bible camp. I have children of my own. And so Vance says, well, write down your name on this piece of paper. And he writes Robert Anderson. Okay. And so Vance remembers looking out in this driveway and seeing this black vehicle. The rims are black. It's an SUV, a Bronco. It's all black. And so now the, the investigators have a black vehicle, a black vehicle, a black vehicle. They have something to go on. And this Robert Anderson tells Vance Dryley, oh, my dad lives a little farther north than here. I've driven by your place a few times going to visit my dad. So the investigators are at the Stryley residence and they're talking. And they ask one of the investigators, does anybody know an Anderson that lives near here? And one of them says, well, there's a grubby Anderson that lives up north here a few miles, but everybody, call, I think his name is Leland Anderson, but everybody calls him grubby. So they looked up this Leland Anderson. He had an arrest record. I mean, he was Robert Anderson's father. So he had been to prison himself. And so it is now three o'clock in the morning. These investigators have been at the Stryleys all afternoon. They've been searching the area, anywhere a body could be found. They're desperate to find Piper. And so at three o'clock in the morning, on this Leland Anderson's arrest record, there's a number for a woman and a phone number. So they, the investigators make up a story and they call this number at three o'clock in the morning. At three o'clock in the morning, a groggy woman answers the phone and one of the investigators lies and he said, I'm sorry to call you at three in the morning, but I'm an over the road trucker and I'm gonna buy a vehicle. Do you have a husband or a son named Robert Anderson? And she said, yeah, I have a son named Robert Anderson but he's not here. He's working the night shift at the Morell's meatpacking plant. And mm. right, when they hear Morell's, they start thinking Larissa Demansky. What did the duct tape killer look like? He was uh, about average height. He was balding, even though he was just in his mid twenties, he was starting to bald. He was kind of pudgy, we call him. He had kind of a, a, baby, <laughs> a, baby, a baby, baby plump, plump build. build. It just looked like kind of a, a big overgrown child's body on a man. Um, and other than that, just rather nondescript. He didn't stand out in any way. Just kind of average looking guy. But what another thing job? we'll tell you about Robert Lee right now. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Sean. What was his job at the meat place? He, he was a maintenance worker. He was a refrigeration he, technician, actually. He, he repaired refrigeration units and things like that. He had a fairly, te a fairly technical job. Right. He was just not a meat processing line worker. He had a he had a more elaborate job. In fact, when they start uh, investigating him, they find that he had a homemade bondage board that fit in the back of his Bronco to shackle women up to. And that that bondage board was actually built against company policy in the shop of the Morell's uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. Jeez, you were going to say something a, a minute, uh, a second ago, Phil. Do you remember what you were going to say? Well, I was just going to say that this Robert Leroy Anderson, he started telling friends from a young age about his desire to kidnap, bondage, rape women, and kill them. So he started sharing from a teenage uh, time in his life that he had these dark fantasies. Right, and, and it escalated. It came to the point where that was almost all he could talk about with his friends. Even people he didn't know that well, he would get on that topic. And the investigators speculated that it just consumed his thoughts. It's probably something he thought about all day long. Who would he, he, who would he grab? What woman was he going to target? What would he do with her? He played it over and over in his mind until it got to the point that fantasizing about it wasn't enough anymore. He had to start acting. But Sean, as you know, you guys, you deal in the true crime. He was awful young to have developed such a mature crime base at his age, at mid-20s. Usually serial killers that have advanced as far as Robert Lee or Anderson are older, in their late 30s to in their 40s. And these crimes were his initial crimes, or was he like doing anything cruel to animals or anything else? We did not un uncover that. Right. They speculate that he might have committed some other crimes, even when he lived in Kansas City. They looked into those, thinking he might have been um, committed some sex crimes in that area, but they could never pin him to. When, when he moved away, when he was a teenager, to live with uh, his friend Glenn Walker in Kansas City, there was some mysterious disappearance of some women that fit the same pattern as what happened to Piper Striley and Larissa Demansky. 
but they could never connect it. But there, some of the some of the investigators were highly suspicious that he may have been involved in some of those even as a teenager. So what happened to the women then? What did he do to them? Well, uh, Larissa Demansky. I think we, we should progress again of how they catch this guy. First, they one, there's an investigator by the name of uh, uh, Bob Grand Prix, and he's in town, and he's a special agent, and he has heard that Piper Striley has been abducted. So he's down at the police department, and he knows how busy these investigators are. But they had the name of this Robert Leroy Anderson. They found his Bronco in the parking lot of the Morell's parking lot, but it was blue. It wasn't black. They went and got that road grade driver and they drove him through the parking lot and they didn't say anything. They said, just look for a vehicle. And when that uh, road grade driver that they stopped out in front of the Stradley residence got by that blue Bronco, he said, stop, wait a minute. If that Bronco right there would be black, that would be the vehicle. It had a CB antenna on it and things. It had some unusual things. Mm -hmm. And so the investigators are thinking they've got this guy, but why isn't the vehicle black? This is not making sense. And so now, Bob Grandpre, the special agent, he volunteers to do an elimination investigation. And that's just what it sounds like. They're thinking there's nothing to tie this Robert Anderson to, to the crime. The colors of the car don't match. Robert Anderson's a common name. So he's going to do the elimination an interview and say, OK, I talked to Robert Anderson. And no, he's not involved. Just how it sounds like he's going to eliminate him as a suspect. So he shows up at Robert Anderson's door, knocks. He can see that Robert Anderson just got out of bed, and he introduces himself. And right away, uh, Robert Grand Prix investigates sexual criminals, and that's his specialty. And as soon as he sees Robert Anderson, just all of his buttons light up, all of his red flags go up, he's creeped out. And he's used to dealing with sex offenders. He knows something is wrong. And he says, uh, will you come with me down to the police department? And Robert Anderson says, uh, yeah, sure. Now, that's not what you say when the police show up at your house and ask you to come with them. You say, what? Why? What is this about? Am I under arrest? Oh, no. He says, come down. So Anderson volunteers to come down and interview with the investigators. Not a lawyer. He's not under arrest. Hasn't been read his Miranda rights. But he volunteers to come down and talk to him. And it turned into a very strange interview. Right away when they get him in the room, Bob Grand Prix starts talking. And he says to Robert Lee Anderson, do you have any idea why I've asked you to come down here? And Robert Lee Anderson, he goes, says, maybe it has something to do with that woman that went missing. And Grand Prix said, well, why would you say that? And Anderson says, well, because I read about it in the paper. Well, Grand Prix, that's not a standard uh, answer. So now Grand Prix priest starts his investigative techniques. He said, well, Robert, have you ever been to the Piper Striley residence? And Robert says, no, I've driven by. My dad lives out by there. And then Grand Prix says, well, why would we have somebody that has said that they've seen you on their property? And then Robert changes his story and said, oh, well, I pulled in there one time and turned around. And then Grand Prix says, well, why would we find your fingerprints on their door? Whether they investigated it or not, he was just, you know, he was doing his investigation. And Robert Lee Anderson said, oh, oh, well, I did go up and knock on the door, but I didn't go in. I was going to ask him about their Bible camp. And, and I tried the door handle. And when he said that, that gave them cause to get search warrants. Mm -hmm. But they needed to keep, um, the, the investigators needed to keep Anderson there. They didn't want him to get lawyered up right away and shut up. Their main concern was Piper could still be alive. As we many of us know, time is a factor when somebody goes missing. They're thinking if they spook this guy off, he might go off and just leave her where he's got her tied up. She could die of exposure or dehydration. He's going to know he's being followed. Um, and so they wanted to keep him talking to try to crack him or get as much as they could. Well, they keep him talking for several hours. And he starts, he, he's going off in these strange directions. He wants to talk. He says he's as smart as Albert Einstein. He's got his own theory on science. And he wanted to talk about black holes in outer space. And... So Bob Grand Prix said, well, Robert, help me out here. If somebody would have abducted Piper Striley, what would they have done? What do you think somebody would have done with her? And he gets Robert talking in third person. Now Robert perks up and he's going, oh, I've heard women are kept as a sex slave. She would be repeatedly raped and tortured. 
And Grand Prix can tell he's getting off about saying what somebody else might have done to Piper Yes, Riley. he was disturbingly excited. Once they got him talking about what might have happened to her, Anderson couldn't shut up. He couldn't stop talking. No. So they, but they keep him there long enough, knowing very well that some of what they were doing might not be admissible in court, but they were willing to take the risk to try to find Piper, to try to bring this young mother home. So they get a search warrant for Robert Leroy Anderson's body, his Bronco, the blue Bronco that's sitting out in the police parking lot, and his home. So they tell him he cannot disturb any of those things until they're done. They put him up in a motel that night. They do a strip search on Robert Leroy Anderson. When he takes his keys out of their pocket, they notice he has handcuff keys on his key ring. Hmm. Not everybody goes around with handcuff keys on their key ring. They also noticed that Robert Lee Anderson did not wear underwear. That ended he, up being important. Very important at the time. As the other team is going through the Bronco, they're finding some disturbing things. Well, first of all, he was a pack rat. They find a lot of interesting things in the Bronco. Receipts, store receipts for duct tape, for paint, tempera paint and paintbrushes, washable paint. They okay. find a homemade bondage board in the back. They can tell it's a bondage board. It's got rings for shackling somebody up to it. It's elevated to uh, raise the person's front end up. And it has indoor outdoor carpet glued to it. And they also find in a toolbox, there was two, two toolboxes back there. One toolbox, the investigators nicknamed the torture box. It had, it had ether in there to dis, uh, to incapacitate somebody, it had eye rings. It had these long nine inch wooden dowels, okay? Quarter inch wooden dowel, all kinds of stuff of a heinous nature. And also inside that toolbox, they found two pieces of fresh vegetation, two hunks of vegetation that inadvertently got put in this toolbox. So they took those vegetation and they're thinking, hmm, if we could identify this plant life, we might be able to come up with a crime scene. So now they go to Robert Lee Ray Anderson's home, some of the things they find there. Well, one of the things they found was a metal piece. Do you wanna, do you wanna show it? It's easier yeah, they, to show Yeah, they started it. finding, and here's one of, here's an actual piece right here. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, wow, wow. And they're they're it's thinking, a, what is that for? Is it to hit somebody is, with? Is it, it a is torture? A weapon? Is it a bondage right. item to torture somebody? All these homemade, and this is an actual one right here, by the way. One of the investigators gave us this because of the book. Okay? And well, then. They, they keep finding receipts for black paint. So they go to the store where he bought it, and they ask the salesperson, you know, can you help me find this paint? And she does. And they say, could you spray a car with this paint? And she says, huh, that's funny. You're the second person this week to ask me that. And so to make a long story short, they bring in a photo lineup of Robert Anderson and some other people who look like him. She picks him out. This is the guy. As the and, person that bought the black washable paint. Right. And, that will wash off a vehicle. And they found drips of paint underneath the hood. You know when you wash your car and it's sudsing up, kind of floats through the... the Engineer. Where the yeah, where the engine area, where the car comes together, and they found these drips of black pa black paint, and determined he had painted his car with black tempera paint. That's why it looked flat black. And he painted the rims and everything so that his mm -hmm. Bronco wouldn't be identified. So now they're getting this guy. But it actually guy. made it more identifiable because it looks so odd. Now here I got to add a couple more things. Back at the Striley residence, now you got to remember DNA evidence was fairly new in the mid 1990s. It was workable, but it was not as complex or not as readily acceptable as it is now. But they took Piper Striley's hairbrush from the bathroom. It had some of her head hairs in it. They also found some blood-stained sanitary pads in the garbage. Piper was menstruating, so they took those. They happened to be very important. When they're going through Robert Lee Ray Anderson's home, they find rolls of duct tape that have been ripped off. So they take the duct tape. They also find a dirty pair of blue jeans in his laundry room. It's got grass stains in the knees and a dark stain right in the crotch. Hmm. So it ends up being blood that matches Piper. So Piper Striley is menstruating the day she gets abducted. He ends up having Piper Striley's blood in his blue jeans. He didn't wear underwear. And did he, so, con did he confess what actually happened? 
he never. he did not confess. So all of this lands on the desk of Assistant Attorney General Larry Long, and but before, they charge yeah, before him. we go there, we got to tell a little, just a little, one more quick story. Okay, they sent those two pieces of vegetation mm -hmm. to South Dakota State University to a botanist, a, a plant expert, and they were identified as black snake root and hornwort. So the investigators asked uh, the botanist could you show us where these plants might grow? And he said, yeah, they're going to be very unusual where they grow. There's got to be running water close by, and there can't be any cattle grazing. So they got a helicopter, and they took this botanist up and flew out near the Piper Striley home for this botanist, this plant expert, to look. And finally, the plant, after they flew around in the helicopter for quite a while, the botanist said, that plant wouldn't be found here. Let's go over along the river north of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So they're flying along the river, and the botanist said, well, set the helicopter down right here. This looks like a prime place for black snake root and hornwort to be growing. So they set it down, and he says, yes, if I was you guys, I would be looking here. So the investigators get a whole bunch of volunteers to come out there, and where that botanist said to be looking, they found a wadded up roll of duct tape, duct tape that had no reason to be there. They found a battery operated vibrator and they found a burnt candle. They also found Piper Striley's nightshirt she was wearing the morning she was abducted, cut in half and ripped down the middle. The duct tape that they found was wadded up. They unrolled it, it had hundreds of strands of human hair on it. Which ended up being that Piper. ended up matching Piper. Some of them had roots, so they were able to match that. And so they know that the way she died is that he had wrapped that duct tape around her. That's Larissa. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so anyway, they have all this evidence now. Also, they interview one of Glenn Walker, if you remember the name, was one of Robert Lee Randerson's childhood friends. Okay. He also had another friend that he spent a lot of time with by the name of Jamie Hammer. The investigator brought Jamie in and Jamie said, yeah, Robert Lee Randerson is strange. He has talked about abducting women and doing all kinds of stuff to them. And Jamie Hammer said he's been making all kinds of sharp items, homemade items, so he could lay them on the highway when he passes a woman and flatten her tire to incapacitate her vehicle so that he can abduct her at night. So he'd pull way ahead of the woman's car, get out, put this in the road, and then wait for her to drive yes. over it. So about... About two months after Larissa Demansky, Sean, goes missing from the Morell's parking lot, another young woman, a 26-year-old, very pretty young woman by the name of Amy Anderson. Mm -hmm. She's driving down the road with a friend. No, uh, no relation to Robert Lee Right, Anderson. right. Okay. They're driving down the road uh, outside of Sioux Falls. She's taking her friend home at night. when they hit something, and they can hear it clunking under the car, but they get to her friend's house Right. Clang, clang, clang. They don't know that, though. And the tire goes flat, but she thinks that she can get to a gas station. And as she's driving down the road, her car tire goes completely flat. And this vehicle pulls over, this good Samaritan, a man gets out, happens to be Robert Leroy Anderson. And she says, oh, you know, thanks for stopping. She opens up her trunk to get the jack out. And he grabs her. And there's a struggle that goes on. And, and there's another man with there him. There is, night. but that man kind of froze. If he had helped, they would have been able to take her. But she fights and struggles. She gets him off balance. She runs up the ditch and is running down this rural road where there, the possibility of someone got, coming down the road is kind of remote. It's at dark. Night. Yeah, it's right? dark. It's dark. But a car comes down the road. It happens to be some teenage girls. They let her get in the car, bring her to a phone. But it's dark. She's not able to give any other information other than two men in a, in a sports car, really. Is basically so now so the investigators have got the connection to the sharp objects. Oh. This Amy Anderson very nearly got abducted by Robert Leroy Anderson. And the, by the way, the friend that was with him happens to be his lifetime childhood friend, Glenn Walker, that he went mm -hmm. to live in Kansas City with. He had talked Glenn Walker into helping him abduct and rape and bondage up women. So they were working as a team at that point. Actually, Glenn yeah. Walker ends up helping Robert Lee Ray Anderson abduct Larissa Demansky from the parking lot of the Morell's meatpacking plant.
Right. But then after they after Amy got away and that really rattled him and Glenn Walker would not help him anymore. But then Robert Lee Anderson got very angry with Glenn Walker to the point where he was going to have a, a cellmate murder Glenn Walker. We'll get to that story here in a minute. Okay, so so then all of this lands on the desk of Assistant Attorney General Larry Long. They can only charge him with first-degree kidnapping, but in the state of South Dakota, that's a life sentence because they're thinking if they later find the body, they could charge him with murder. So he ends up going to prison, and that's when things get interesting. That's when you'd think the story ended, but it just so happens he goes into ADSIG, and then we're getting to it now. This is, this is when they do find out what happened to the women or they, they never would. So they go after Robert Lee Anderson for first degree kidnap. They've got all this evidence, the blood in the, the blood stained pants. They can, they've got enough evidence. We know you took that woman, Piper Striley, in front of her children. Okay. Here's another thing. The little boy, remember Shana answers the phone and said a mean man carried mommy away. Nathan, her little brother, turned two years old the day before Piper was abducted. The parents had given him one of these vinyl little kids as plastic play tents for a Christmas, for a birthday present. And it was in his room. And Shana's crying and she says, the mean man who shot a loud noise in our house, he also took Nathan's play tent. Daddy, he took Nathan's play tent. Well, the investigators are thinking that Robert Lee Ranson took the play tent to wrap Piper's body in when he was done with her. But that story comes out later. Right, when we get to we the get prison. To Anderson so goes to into here. so they right. do they do have a long uh, kidnap trial, Sean. Very intense, a lot of security. In fact, Piper Striley's dad wanted revenge. He told people he was going to kill Robert Lee Anderson. He drove up from many miles away, maybe a thousand miles away, to come to the trial of the man who abducted and killed his daughter Piper. And during the jury selection, Piper's dad would sit in the jury and hold like an invisible pistol and be shooting it at Robert Anderson. One day, Piper's dad brought a mirror in and sat by the sun and would reflect the sunlight into Robert's eyes. And the judge was brought to the attention of the judge. And so the attorney general and the judge took Piper's dad out in the hallway and said, look, what are you doing? And he said, you guys are going after kidnap. You're not going after the death penalty. He deserves to die and I'm going to kill him. And the judge says, look, the state's attorney says, take it back right now. We know you're upset. Just tell us you didn't mean it. And Piper's dad said, no, I mean it. I'm going to kill him. So Piper's father was banished from the trial, and he couldn't be within three blocks of the courthouse. And from that point on, Robert Lee Anderson wore a bulletproof vest. There was a lot of revenge within the area, within our community. People wanted to get to this guy pretty bad. And so one of the big, the big controversies about the kidnap trial, Sean, was the prosecution wanted four-year-old Shana to testify to identify the mean man who up carried her mommy away. She's the only living witness to what happened. Of course, the defense attorney said, no, she's too young, and we have the right to cross-examine that little girl. We're going to reduce her to tears. You know what our job is. People are going to hate us once we cross-examine that little girl. The judge ruled that Shana could testify. He talked to her himself. She understood the oath and telling the truth. Okay, and tell a little more about that with the blanket. Right, and then Shana had been working with a child psychologist, and this psychologist had given her a little blanket, and Shana would wrap herself in it as her way of saying, I've had enough, I can't talk anymore. So the this psychiatrist is working with Shana as is a female at, um, attorney, and they're questioning her and just saying things like, what's your name? And tell us what happened. And as soon as they approach that line of questioning. About Shana, Robert Lee Ray Anderson. Right. Shana just wraps herself in that blanket tighter and tighter until you can just see her little body, you know, trying to disappear inside of that. And there and wasn't that point, a dry eye in the courtroom and that they had to just stop. But during the kidnap trial, the jury still got to hear little Shana's voice. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened. After Robert Lee Anderson has abducted her mother right in front of her, her dad calls home, calls back home. He's looking to talk to Piper. Well, Shana, by the time she gets to the phone and picks it up, Vance, her father, has already hung up the phone. 
but the tape recording machine in their home kept recording. It was one of the old-fashioned yeah. answering machines. It was an old-fashioned telephone answering machine that the Strileys had hooked up to their phone. And they brought that in, and on that tape recording, it's got the little girl saying, Papa, Papa, please call back. Please call back. Oh, I hope he calls back again. And so that was very emotional. The jury nailed Robert Lee Ray Anderson for first-degree kidnap, and he gets sentenced to life in prison. But it's not done at that point. Now Robert Lee Ray Anderson is sent to prison for life, and he's held in the notorious ad seg wing. Right, that's administrative segregation where they put only the most violent criminals and the death row inmates. It's a prison within a prison, really. And so he ends up becoming cellmates with Jeremy Bruner. Now, Jeremy Bruner is only about 21, but he is seasoned. He is just, he's one of those people who can look at you and after talking to you for a minute, he practically knows your life story. He knows what buttons to push. He knows how to to work people. And, and everybody knows he's a notorious right, criminal. Right. They, they know that he's a gang member, that he's been involved in drive-by shootings, and that he beat a first-degree murder rap. Now, that really intrigues Robert Anderson. He wants to know, how can you beat a murder rap? Robert Lear right. Anderson, by the way, Sean, became cellmates with Jeremy Brunner, yeah. this hardcore criminal. So the problem with this, though, is that none of that was true. Now, Brunner was very wise, and he was in prison for some low-level thefts and low-level drug, drug sales. Yeah, just small so drug yeah, sales. So he had no status in and the maximum security prison. he knew prison. you don't want to go into a maximum security prison being low man on the totem pole. So he paid an inmate uh, one can of chewing tobacco to make up this fake rap sheet and then leak it to the other inmates. So that he had this high-level status. Now, he right. got away with this. You can't keep a lot of secrets from the inmates. And they know a lot about you. But Jeremy Bruner was not from the state of South Dakota. He got himself in trouble and was doing prison time. He was from Michigan, many hundreds of miles away. So nobody really knew what his background was. But he leaked this fake rap sheet, including the fact that he beat a murder rap. Right. So um, now Bruner is very wise and very smart about the legal system. Anderson is a newborn. Yeah. He doesn't know any of the ins and outs you know, of Anderson that. was smart, but he hadn't been around prison. Jeremy right. Bruner had been incarcerated almost his whole life, from a teenager all the way up into his early 20s. Mm -hmm. He so, knew the prison system. So they are no match, and Robert Anderson is eager to know, how did you beat this prison rap? And right away... Bells go off in Bruner's head. He He's thinking ahead. He makes up this story to make a long story short. Well, you, you well, go ahead. You Jeremy Bruner tells Robert Lee Ray Anderson, who's sitting on the edge of his bed, this is how I beat a murder rap. Okay? I planted some evidence on a guy that I knew that didn't have an alibi, and I paid a witness to testify against him. I had a good lawyer, and once they saw that evidence in this guy's home and the other uh, witness testified against him, they dropped the murder charges against me. So now, Robert Lee Ray Anderson said, could you help me do that, Bruner? I would like to pin my crimes on somebody else. Could we do it? So Bruner said, well, let me talk to my brother on the outside and my people on the streets. He plays hard to get. He plays a little hard to get, and Anderson is just chomping at the bits. He wants, he wants Bruner to help him pin his crimes on somebody else. So finally, a while later, Bruner says, yeah, Anderson, we can get this pulled off. You have to start out by transferring $500 into my brother's account, which he actually had him do. He conned him out of $500. And he said, now, I don't want you to pull any crap on me. In order for us to pull this off, Anderson, I need to know everything that happened during those murders, everything you know, everything the cops know, and everything the cops don't know, or this will blow up in our face. And also, Bruner knows no criminal is going to tell everything right away. So he keeps pushing him for more and more and more information. So now Bruner's sucking this information. So, so, so they, now we can tell exactly what happened to Larissa Demansky. We can tell exactly right now what happened to Piper Striley because Robert Lee Anderson told his cellmate, Jeremy Bruner, in detail exactly what happened. So let's go back to Larissa Demansky. Him and Glenn Walker, he had already talked his his lifelong friend into abducting and raping women. With okay. So Jeremy Bruner is telling Anderson he needs to know everything about these crimes. If he wants his help in pinning Anderson's crimes onto somebody else, 
he has to know everything, every detail. I want to know what the cops know. I want to know what they don't know. And he says, or this will blow up in our face. He tells Anderson, I have a guy, I'm going to call him Mr. Ghost. And this Mr. Ghost doesn't have an alibi. I need some items to plan in this Mr. Ghost car or house. And then I have a girl that will date him. And then she'll say that Mr. Ghost tried to rape her. And when they find those items in his car or in his house, then you can get a good lawyer to get you an acquittal on your crimes. We can pin it on this Mr. Ghost. So Bruner is conning him. The con is conning the con. And so he tells Anderson, I need some items. What can I plant in Mr. Ghost's car or house? And Anderson thinks and he says, okay, I've hidden some things in my mother's basement up in the rafters. I took some jewelry off Piper Striley when I murdered her. And I took some jewelry off Larissa Demansky. So Anderson now proceeds to say, well, tell me exactly what happened. So now we'll quickly tell you the Larissa Demansky story. On the night Larissa Demansky goes missing from the Morrells parking lot, Glenn Walker and Robert Lee Ray Anderson are waiting in their vehicle for her to go to her car, which is parked way out in the parking lot. Larissa Demansky gets off work at one o'clock in the morning. Right when she gets to her car and puts her keys in the door to unlock the driver's side door, they come up behind her and throw her on the ground. That's why her keys were found in the van. They duct tape her up and they throw her in the trunk of Anderson's car. Anderson is going to take her out to a secluded area where him and Glenn Walker are going to proceed to rape Larissa Demansky. Well, before they get out of town, Glenn Walker gets cold feet and he says, oh, take me home. I don't want to be a part of this. So Anderson drops Glenn Walker off. He takes Larissa Demansky out and proceeds to rape her repeatedly for four hours. Larissa Demansky begs for her life, saying, I won't tell anybody, I won't turn you in. She knows him. She worked with Robert Leroy Anderson. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm six weeks pregnant. Please let me live. Well, when Robert Leroy Anderson is done abducting and raping her, he takes duct tape and he slowly wraps it around her mouth and nose, slowly suffocating her to death leaving her eyes open so that he can watch her struggle and die right before his eyes. And when he tells this to Bruner, he's not at all ashamed or embarrassed. He's almost proud of what yeah, he's He kind of laughs and he says, yeah, she tells me, my husband is the only man I've been sexual with. Can you please just let me go? I won't tell anybody. And so after Larissa is dead, he throws her in the trunk of his car, her body, and he goes home and takes a nap and get some sleep. There's no conscience. No conscience. Then he drives to where Glenn Walker is, his friend who got cold feet, and he said, you're going to help me bury her. You were involved in getting her abducted. I raped her, but you're going to help me bury her. So now those two go out, not too far from Piper Striley's residence, up by a lake up there, and there's a great big chokecherry bush, and they bury Larissa Demansky beneath the chokecherry bush. Okay. So, during the kidnap trial, when Robert Lee Anderson gets found guilty of first-degree murder, they know that Glenn Walker is involved. Glenn Walker calls and leaves a message on a friend's house saying, we need to come up with an alibi for Robert, saying why he was out by the Striley residence. So this, this friend brought the tape recording to the police. So now the prosecutors know that Glenn Walker is involved somehow with this crime, but they don't know how. So they subpoena him and make him come to court every day thinking he might be called up to witness for something. They don't, they don't know how he's involved, so they can't call him up, but they just want to make him nervous, and they do. During so, this kidnap trial. Right. So, so he goes to the attorneys and he says, uh, you know, I, I can tell you where Larissa is buried in exchange for immunity. And the prosecutor is very sharp. He says, what do you need immunity from? And uh, Glenn, Walker. Glenn Walker says, well, one time when I was driving with Anderson, he pointed out and he showed me where Larissa's is buried. And the guy said, well, you don't need immunity. That's not illegal for someone to show you where they buried somebody. But in the end, he ends up telling, showing the police where Larissa is buried. So and then after that, he claims he thought he had immunity 
So now oh, Glenn Walker is locked up in prison, mm -hmm. and Glenn Walker has now taken the authorities and shown them where Larissa Demansky is buried. Now, remember, they only went after Robert Lee Randerson for first degree kidnap because they didn't have a body. Well, there's a lot more details in the book that we can't really go into, but now they have a body. They have Larissa Demansky. And now Jeremy Bruner plays his hand. Mm -hmm. He goes to the prison authorities and he said, hey, if you want to nail Robert Lee Ray Anderson for first degree murder and get the death penalty against him, I've got some information for you. But I want to talk to the attorney general of the state. And you might know this. They have a saying in prison that an inmate's word isn't worth a bucket of warm spit because they might say anything to, to, to try, to, try to, get to get out. out. You're right. So the prison officials say, look, the attorney general of the state of South Dakota is not going to talk to you, Bruner, unless you give us something really good. You give us something, and then we'll get a hold of them. Now, a less experienced person might have told them everything he knows, but Bruner just tells them one thing. And here's what he says. He goes, you guys think that Robert Lee Ray Anderson took that little boy's vinyl play tent out of the house that day when he abducted Piper to wrap her body in, but you got it wrong. There was a struggle in that bedroom, and Robert Lee Ray Anderson shot a nine millimeter hole through that kid's play tent and through the floorboard of that kid's bedroom. If you go out there and pull the carpet back, you're going to see there's a hole, a bullet hole in the floorboard of that little kid's bedroom. And he took the tent because it had a bullet hole in it and a powder burn. And so they sent authorities out. They pulled the carpet back. Sure enough, there was a bullet hole. They inserted a rod into that hole. They got the angle. They went underneath the trailer home. They yeah. dug with their bare hands and they got the nine millimeter slug out of the dirt. Now, Jeremy Bruner says, I'm going to give you some more evidence. He planted jewelry that he took for souvenirs off those two women and a handgun, the nine millimeter handgun and handcuffs. And here's the map. I had Robert Lee Ray Anderson draw me a map to where my people on the street could get the evidence to plan on Mr. Ghost. But the authorities go to the, to the home that Robert Lee Ray Anderson's mother owned and they found that jewelry, the handgun, and so now Bruner gets out. He's out on the street. They cut him loose. Bruner did his job. So now we will tell what happened to Piper Striley, how her abduction went down, because Bruner did uh, receive that information from Robert Lee Anderson. So the morning of Monday, when Piper goes missing, you want to start the story? Right. So she's in her house with her two children, and there's a knock at the door. Shana answers and there's kind of some commotion and Robert Leroy Anderson comes in the house down the hall. He knocks Piper back on her bottom and there's a struggle. She yells to her kids, run and hide, and they do. And the gun goes off in the struggle. Not sure if he was trying to show her who was in charge and scare her or, or she was or she was grabbed or she was grabbing for the gun, but it did go off and shoot right. a hole through the through the play tent in the bedroom. But he carried her outside, put her in the vehicle, uh, down on the floorboard, and told her to be quiet. Then he drives her to this secluded spot where the botanist said you can find honewort and black but, snake root. Mm -hmm. Remember, the investigators have already found a vibrator, a burnt candle, and wadded up duct tape, and Piper's nightshirt cut in half. So Robert Lee Ray Anderson takes Piper to that location. He shackles her up to the bondage board where he cuts and rips her clothes and her underwear and things off. She tries to say, I'm menstruating. He says, I don't care That's about cute. that. He proceeds to rape her repeatedly. And then he told Brunner he straddled her body and slowly choked her to death with his eyes two inches from her eyes so he could watch her die. He said he was very disappointed because she just closed her eyes and died very passively. She didn't beg or struggle or kick around. She just kind of went to sleep. So he was very disappointed. Then he loaded Piper's body up on the front floorboard of his vehicle, drove right through the town of Sioux Falls, and he told Bruner that he took her to a secluded area along the river that he could go fishing at. He had permission to go fishing. And he said he waded out with Piper's body and put her body under a log jam, a backed up log jam where the current would not wash her downstream. 
some of the investigators don't believe that because sexual sadists like him like to be able to go back and revisit the grave. We know Anderson did that with Larissa. He would go back to her grave and fire uh, rounds into the He would the shoot ground. nine nine millimeter slugs into yeah. Larissa's grave, kind of like it to relive the murder. So they they do believe Piper is some some of them believe that Piper is buried somewhere she has not been. So found. now Piper's body has never been found, even though there's been a huge search. Some of the investigators, this many years later from 1996, has still not given up trying to find Piper's body. Maybe he was telling Bruno the truth. Maybe he did put her under a log jam jam in the river. Nobody knows. But all of the tears, all the investigators, all of the volunteers searching for Piper couldn't bring her home. Her body has never been found. Larissa Demansky did receive a burial. And now the officials, they have enough to go after Robert Lee Ray Anderson for first degree murder and the death penalty, which they do. He's now charged with uh, capital murder. Another trial ensues. It's uh, pretty standard. It goes on for a long time. The jury returns a guilty verdict. Uh, Bruner testifies uh, on behalf of the state, uh, which was Bruner got himself in some trouble when he was out on the street. Bruner couldn't keep himself out of trouble. He sold some fake drugs to an undercover agent before the murder trial came up. He gets put in jail. He hadn't been out 10 days. He hadn't been out of prison 10 days and he gets caught. Uh, selling fake drugs, but as they're booking him into the jail, well, I'll have to tell you about Bruner. He, he was as tall as he is wide, weighed you know, maybe 400 pounds, and he had tucked some real drugs under one of his fat rolls. Methamphetamines. So, so booking him into the jail, they find that. He's trying to smuggle methamphetamines into the jail. That's a felony. So now Bruner gets put back into prison, and he's getting, well, everybody knows what happens to snitches in the prison. Now, Half of the inmates were supporting Bruner. They felt that Robert Lee Ray Anderson's crimes were so bad and mm -hmm. children were involved that he deserved the death penalty. But some of the inmates were calling Bruner a snitch. There were threats against his life. Bruner had no more incentive to testify against Robert Lee Ray Anderson. Bruner's going to spend his life in prison. He's a career criminal. But this is Bruner's character. Even though he's receiving death threats, he does, he's not going to benefit anything by testifying against Robert Lee Ray Anderson. He does anyway, because he felt Robert Lee Ray Anderson deserved to die by doing those crimes in front of those kids. And Larissa Demansky had two little girls. And so he does testify against Anderson. So in the end, I kind of ended up, a lot of people end up kind of liking Bruner. I think they all do. Everyone who met him said, you can't help but like the you guy. You can't, yeah. He's he, just a character. I wish you could tell you everything we knew he, about he's a, him. He's, 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 a, he's a con man, but you know, he conned the right guy. So they land the death penalty against Robert Lee Ray Anderson. Anderson is put back into the ad seg wing. Now, not as a lifetime uh, inmate, but as a death row inmate. Now he's waiting for the executioner's needle. And about two years goes by. And, and, and his father commits suicide. And this really hit Anderson hard, even though they had a complicated relationship. And then about a year later in 2003, um, they found Anderson hanging, hanging. from his cell. Right. He committed suicide. Was and that so the same that's method the, that his father used? Um, his his father, father shot himself. Right. Father shoots himself. Uh, Robert Leroy Anderson hangs himself. And so... That's uh, Larry Long that prosecuted him, uh, made a comment to the paper. He said, well, I think there's a lot of women that are going to be sleeping easier tonight knowing that Robert Lee Ray Anderson is no longer in this world. I've dealt with a lot of evil people in my 40-year career, but he is probably the most evil person I've ever come across in my life. Did he At leave 20, a suicide note? He, he, he did. did. But it was not released. It's never been made public. From what we've heard, it was just basically some personal things to his sister, his mom, you know, a couple his brothers. It was just some personal stuff. But when he went, went really all hope of actually ever finding Piper's body, had he done did bury her somewhere. Uh, you know, you never know. Maybe that blue play tent, maybe he did wrap her body in the little mm -hmm. kid's blue play tent. So the investigators are hoping that some hunter or somebody hiking sometime will notice some plastic blue thing sticking out of the ground and maybe they'll find Piper's body. They still occasionally get some some Tips. leads. They did rather recently. They got a, a tip. So Amy Anderson, no relation to Robert Anderson, was very lucky. She narrowly escaped 
the same fate. We know that he had many other women's names and their their state where they worked and their habits. He was ready to come. In fact, he told Bruner that he was focusing on the prison nurse. That if the, if he would get out, he was going to abduct the prison nurse and rape and murder her. And we wow. actually did get did did get to meet that prison nurse. So we're talking a heinous heinous individual. So his accomplice Glenn Walker. What did he get sentenced to? He he did he ended up getting sentenced to twenty years. Um, uh, and, conspiracy to kidnap, conspiracy uh, to be involved in murder. Uh, he never signed any papers for uh, any immunity when he showed him where Larissa Demansky's grave was. He just voluntarily did it. But they wanted the prosecutors wanted him to, and he ended up. They had a good time program in the pr South Dakota prison system. He was sentenced to twenty years. He ended up doing fourteen and getting released after 14 years. Glenn Walker has been out, and I'll bet since our book came out, he's been keeping a low profile. He doesn't Do you know what he area. does now? No, he doesn't live in the area anymore. He moved out of the state. Mm -hmm. Once he was paroled, there were no restrictions that he had to stay in the state of South Dakota. So he packed up and left, and I'm sure somebody knows where he's at, but at this point, we don't know where he's at. He left the state. What happened to Jeremy Bruna? <laughs> He, he has a, a business, I believe, like a tattooing business, and... He I lives in another said, state. Yeah. We kind of said Jeremy Bruner just kind of rode off into the criminal sunset. When his time was done being served in South Dakota prison, he probably went back to his home state of Wisconsin. But he runs a business, and he's, uh, he's kept a pretty low profile, but a, a pretty likable guy in the long run. You know, some people might call him the typical jailhouse snitch or rat. And some people say, no, he's a stand up guy. He wasn't going to get anything out of it. He had multiple death threats, but he still testified against Anderson because he felt it was the right thing to do. A little bit, just one more quick story about Bruner's character. If you remember, Piper's dad got banned from the kidnap trial and he couldn't come within any part of any anywhere near the, the courthouse. So he didn't get to hear all the testimony or anything that Bruner got to say during the murder trial. Piper's dad was not allowed to attend the murder trial as well. After Anderson got convicted of first degree murder and got the death sentence, Bruner said, I would like to tell Piper's dad what he wants to know. I'd like a secret meeting with him. And even though it was hard for Bruner, he met with Piper's dad privately and shared anything that Piper's dad wanted to know so that he could have peace of mind. That's Bruner's character. So like I said, I don't view Bruner as just a typical jailhouse snitch. I kind of view him as a stand-up guy. Yes, he's a criminal. He's a shady character, but he's got he's got a pretty good side to him right. as well. Justice would not have been served without him. Without Jeremy Bruner. Wow, what a powerful story. I've just sat here absolutely riveted, and I could really see it being made into a movie. Amazing. Good grief. What an evil person. Mm -hmm. Evil, evil. Whew. So what other stuff are you guys working on now? Well, you know, we've just, there's, once this book comes out, you know, there's still a lot of things. We're, uh, we're having an interview with Sean right now. You know, we still go on book talks uh, with this COVID-19 uh, uh, virus thing that's going around. It really shut down a lot of our talks. You know, we go around to fundraisers and libraries and go to small communities. And, and we, we do a lot of speaking, a lot of that down and you know when that opens back up we'll be doing more with that but there's there's a lot of follow-up and you know with hollywood our hollywood connection with our story about the gitchy girl uh book that we wrote you know we're very busy with that as well so in the description in the description box below this video then for the people watching this are going to be links to your books and links to your socials and are you on all the socials and do you have a preferred method of people getting in touch with you Facebook. Facebook. Right. right. Yeah. Phil and Sandy Hammond. Yeah. And so if, you, uh, if you can email me those links, I'll, I'll get them all in the description box for you. Great. And uh, here's the book we were just talking about, Up Tape Killer. And if they're interested in uh, the other books, there's Gitchy Girl and the sequel, Gitchy Girl Uncovered. Tremendously compelling stories for your uh, viewers that are interested in reading. That's fantastic. My mind is absolutely blown, and I'm sure it's, it, this video is going to get a really good reception. So thank you very much for your time, guys. Thank you, Yeah, Sean, Sean thank you very much for having we us. We have a great program. We always enjoy it. 
Oh, I appreciate that. Cheers. Let me just stop recording. Let's see. There we